Hello, and welcome to today's webinar, Exploring the Sustainable Material of Green Shirts and Man-Made Cellulosics. Today's presentation will be recorded and sent out to all registered participants and also will be posted on the Hub. We will have a Q&A portion throughout the presentation. You can type your questions into the question box on the webinar doc. Now on to Simone with Textile Exchange. Simone? Thank you, Rose. Welcome to today's webinar. My name is Simone Seisel. I'm the MMCF or Man-Made Cellulosic Fibers Lead at Textile Exchange. And I'm supported by our program coordinator, Prana Pandey, thanks to her. And it's great to have Canopy with us today. Um, the context boldly said 99% of MMCFs currently are wood-based, less than 1% recycled or next generation. And we have heard a lot, just recently, we've heard a lot about the need to action. In the past months, we've seen videos and a lot of announcements made during and after COP26. But science tells us this is not enough. Today, we will get an update on the leading work of Canopy and their hot button report and ranking just recently released. But before handing over, next slide, please. Let me remind everyone of the antitrust statement. We value diversity of views, experience, and opinions. Um, but when collaborating, we expect the community to only share information, ideas, resources of publicly available uh, information and avoid discussion on price, st strategic plans, and any private and sensitive information. Thank you. Next slide. So thank you to um, Amanda and Peter um, getting up early today and um, being here for us, not only for a presentation, but also for a dedicated uh, question and answer session. Um, Amanda Carey is Director of Strategic Initiatives at Canopy and Dr. Peter Wood is Senior Corporate Campaigner at Canopy. So let me, uh, before handing over, let me encourage you to type your questions into the Q&A box, as Rose also mentioned. And we, any question that we will not get to answering today, we will um, come back. And also, of course, slides and recording all will be shared. So make sure you're also part of the MMCF Hub community if you're not yet, because this is where you will find all our follow-up resources. So over to you, Amanda. Thanks, uh, super excited to be here. Uh, as Simone mentioned and the slide mentioned, my name is Amanda Carr and I'm Director of Strategic Initiatives at Canopy and I support our team that works uh, specifically with the fashion sector. Um, so uh, we can get started. You can go next slide, please. So a little bit about who Canopy is for those who haven't uh, joined us before. And I know for many of you, uh, those who have uh, policies in place with Canopy, we've been going through the, the details and the findings of our hot button report one-on-one uh, -on -one together. And we're of course always available uh, to do that kind of deep dive. Um, Canopy is an environmental not-for-profit and we were established now 21 years ago. Uh, our headquarters are in Vancouver, but we work uh, internationally as a team. Uh, we've been on Zoom uh, for many, many years <laughs> together. Um, and we're very focused on collaboratively engaging companies um, uh, to work on their forest procurement. And specifically, we work on paper, uh, packaging, and uh, as we'll be talking about and digging in today, uh, forest-based fabrics as well. Uh, we're a little bit unique uh, in the space in that we don't have any membership fees or any financial arrangements with uh, any of the brands or retails or producers uh, of fiber that we collaborate with. And instead, our model is based on having a public facing uh, commitment and a commitment uh, not to source from the world's ancient and endangered forests. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, I think uh, it was mentioned that the slides might not uh, forward uh, might take a minute. Um, so uh, Canopy's focus and our mission is on protecting the world's forests, species and climate. And of course, forests are very foundational uh, to life from our very first breath 
uh, we breathe in the oxygen that forests create, and of course they breathe in uh, the carbon dioxide that we're breathing out constantly. Next slide, please. In addition to our own lives, uh, forests uh, offer over 80% of the world's species um, a habitat. So they're 80% of the world's species are dependent on forests at some point in their life cycle. Next slide, please. And of course, uh, they're home to many, many frontline communities. Uh, I was looking at the FAO data just yesterday to see where we're at in terms of, um, you know, the number of people relying on forests. Uh, and I found it interesting that in Indonesia alone, 95 million people are, are dependent on forests for their livelihoods. Uh, this is a picture uh, of a family in the region of Aceh. Uh, it's a place where Canopy works with local environmental organizations to forward uh, conservation of the Loiser ecosystem, which is the last place on earth where uh, rhino, tiger, orangutan, as well as elephants uh, still live uh, in, in what we picture uh, of an Indonesian rainforest. Next slide, please. In addition to communities, um, also, of course, forests are very, very important in, as our first line of defense against the climate crisis. Uh, so uh, you might remember a few years ago, uh, Elon Musk tweeting out, uh, you know, I think it was a hundred million dollars offered to the best uh, carbon sequestration technology and, and many, many folks uh, simply tweeted back, how about, for, how about the trees? Uh, they're literally uh, built to absorb uh, carbon dioxide and you take one tree, uh, add it to the number of trees in a forest, all the plants that you can see uh, from this image, as well as the deep uh, soils. And more and more science is telling us about the carbon that's stored in soils and peatlands. Uh, and of course, we have uh, one of our best defenses against climate change. Next slide, please. Recent research is also telling us about the links between uh, deforestation or habitat destruction, biodiversity loss, and, um, and viruses uh, and disease uh, spreading within human populations. So for a long time, the science has told us that as we increase uh, those interfaces and decrease habitat, we have more potential for exchange of, um, of disease. Uh, but the most recent science has been looking at with biodiversity loss, species like bats and rats uh, can thrive. And of course, those are the species uh, that carry some of the pathogens that can most uh, easily jump to humans. Next slide, please. So we have all those reasons uh, to protect forests, very, very good reasons. Um, these two next slides will just show us sort of where we're at. So this is a map of the um, extent of forests pre-industrialization. And these would be classified as intact forests. So areas that don't have uh, roads, that haven't been um, harvested, uh, and we don't see uh, impacts within significantly large areas. Next slide, please. And you can see this is what we have left today. Uh, so it's a call to action to do what we can um, to make sure that these ancient and endangered forests and intact forests uh, remain standing. Next slide, please. So um, about seven years ago, Canopy had been working uh, for a long time in the paper. Uh, and of course, we understand paper-based packaging very, uh, very well as well and the sourcing for that. And what we noticed is that as certain markets that we've been working on, things like newsprint were shrinking, um, we weren't seeing those mills that traditionally produce newsprint close necessarily. Instead, we were seeing a number of them being bought up, uh, plans to convert them to something called dissolving pulp. And uh, dissolving pulp uh, goes into many, many products, uh, but about 70% um, of it ends up in fabrics. So this is a cleared landscape. Um, it would be replanted with plantations. Uh, some of those plantations could go into things like palm oil, uh, but also we see um, trees such as acacia and eucalyptus uh, being planted uh, often uh, to go into the fabric supply chain. And so the, the um, 
the family of fabrics that include forests are called man-made cellulosics. And within that family, uh, we have your, um, your standard rayon, uh, viscous, modal, and lyocell all go in, are all part of this family, as well as acetates. And there's also some trademarked brands as well. Uh, so probably one of the best known uh, trademarked brands is Tencel. We also have things uh, like uh, Leva. Um, and so we're looking at that entire family, all of those fabrics that are made from forests. Next slide, please. So after a tree is harvested, um, the chips get turned into something called a dissolving pulp. Uh, that dissolving pulp um, uh, requires chemical inputs. And uh, you'll see as Peter goes through our hot button report, we are partnered with uh, ZDHC, uh, Zero Discharge Hazardous Chemical, uh, to support um, our information um, on uh, chemical processing uh, in this supply chain. Next slide, please. Dissolving pulp is then shipped uh, all over the world, um, a lot of it uh, being uh, imported by China, where a significant amount of the fiber production happens. Uh, again, uh, there are mills uh, distinct that do the fiber production. And that dissolving pulp, when we looked at import data into China, is coming from places uh, largely from Brazil, North America, Indonesia, um, and South Africa. And so if we were to look back at our map, those, of course, are some of the landscapes uh, where ancient and endangered forests um, are still standing. Next slide, please. And then this, um, of course, in turn gets turned into thread, uh, knitted, uh, created into fabric, uh, and ends up um, in all of our closets uh, and on um, in our uh, fabric and apparel. Next slide, please. So uh, Canopy, in the early days of the Canopy Style Initiative, calculated that about a third uh, of the forest fiber had, was coming from ancient and endangered forests. Uh, our estimate now is that about 200 million trees are going into these fabric lines. Um, and we took this information and this potential touch point for ancient and endangered forests out to brands and retailers. Um, and we asked them to put in place public facing um, commitments and policies uh, to end sourcing from the world's ancient endangered forests and work on solutions. So what can we use uh, for fiber instead? Things like recycled textiles, for example. Um, and today we have 455 brands, retailers and designers who have partnered with the Canopy Style Initiative. Uh, we represent collectively $791 billion in annual revenue. Um, and the latest to join us, uh, we've actually had uh, 200 uh, brands and retailers join us uh, over the last 18 months. Momentum is growing. And the latest to join us uh, being Amazon, uh, Walmart, Sam's Club. And uh, we're also very excited to have Puma join us, um, looking for um, and interested in working with more sportswear, sportswear brands as well. Next slide, please. So how the initiative works is Canopy provides our expertise from forest floor up to the fiber producer. And then we ask you, uh, once you've put in place a procurement policy, we have a timeline uh, that we work on together for you as a brand and retailer to work back through the supply chain and understand which fiber producer you're buying from. And what's really interesting uh, and unique about this supply chain is that uh, at that fiber producer level, things are very, very concentrated. So the top 10 producers of these man-made cellulosic fibers control 82% of the global production or global market share. And so um, in, in addition to working very closely with brands and retailers, Canopy works very, very closely uh, and collaborates with fiber producers directly. And uh, I'm going to hand it over uh, to Dr. Peter Wood, who leads our team on uh, working with these fiber producers. And, and Peter, you can take a moment to introduce yourself as well. <laughs> sure, thanks a lot. And uh, yes, I'm, I'm Peter Wood. I am the, uh, one of the senior corporate campaigners uh, here at Canopy. And I've been on board for about a year now. And even though I've had about 20 years experience uh, in this field, uh, and and I did my PhD on you know forest certification and looking at the impacts on the ground. 
I have to confess, this has been quite an uh, education for me coming up to speed uh, uh, with understanding uh, the MMCF market. I'm absolutely fascinated by the, the way that, uh, that, that Canopy has uh, uh, innovated to, to really uh, uh, grasp the full uh, supply chain and to achieve real actions on the ground. Um, next slide, please. So uh, here we are, we're gonna start in the forest uh, appropriately. Uh, here we are looking into the uh, heart of Borneo. This is uh, uh, Sarawak in, in Malaysia. And I'd like you all to picture a tree. Uh, the tree visible above ground uh, is, is hot button report, which is often the uh, focus uh, of the canopy style work. But as we all know, deep below the ground, uh, supporting that tree is a, a very rich network of roots and soil. Uh, and so today I want to explore a little bit about all that goes in uh, uh, behind the scenes uh, to uh, supporting uh, that, that more visible uh, uh, hot button report uh, where we uh, uh, assess and rank the uh, MMCF producers of the world. Uh, in addition, uh, we will also look at uh, the uh, results of this year. Uh, next slide, please. So it starts with uh, achieving uh, canopy style uh, policy commitments. Uh, and out of the, uh, we have, currently have 24 global producers of viscose fiber, uh, including the, the five largest that have established a canopy style uh, policy commitment uh, with us. And uh, once this policy is in place, the viscose fiber producer begins to implement and, and use it as a tool to support them uh, as they undertake annual audits. Uh, next slide, please. So the canopy style audit is really, uh, I would say is the guts of, of uh, the, the program. This is where we uh, really explore um, in conjunction with the producer to understand where their material comes from in the world. Uh, it is done um, by an independent auditor. Uh, the uh, uh, costs are, are paid by the producer uh, and, and to the independent auditor. Um, they are very uh, comprehensive and uh, it, it achieves a lot of transparency into uh, uh, the supply chain at that point. Um, it, uh, we, we've achieved seven audits that have been completed in the past year. Uh, now this is really picking up the pace and we're seeing uh, increasingly uh, so many are happening that we started to cluster these. Uh, so we had a, a, a group announcement in October uh, of six new audits. There are five in the pipeline. So in total, we're looking at about 70% of global uh, MMCF capacity uh, has achieved one of these audits. And these audits in turn, uh, we are able to see where there is room for improvement, uh, what the level of risk is. Uh, and it, it, uh, it really gives us a, a great starting point um, to issuing recommendations that could then be worked through and we can be able to better support the producer in reaching higher uh, and improving their performance. And, and uh, that is uh, what we recognize uh, among other things uh, in the hot button report uh, issued annually. Uh, next slide, please. So this year in the hot button report, uh, there have been no, no changes in terms of uh, uh, the criteria that were used for evaluation. Uh, so if you're familiar with, with uh, those criteria from last year, they're, they're exactly the same. Uh, I will look a little bit more at that uh, coming up. Um, in the report, there is, in addition to the uh, score and, and shirt color, as we'll, we'll get into, there's also uh, an indication of the level of risk uh, that's associated uh, with, with that producer. As Amanda mentioned, uh, we partner with ZDHC to evaluate uh, uh, chemical use and emissions. And uh, new for this year is we have a special symbol 
that recognizes uh, where there are uh, commercially available uh, next generation uh, 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 products available. Um, and I believe there's four this year that, that have been recognized as having that commercially available uh, uh, next gen uh, alternative uh, fiber products. Uh, next slide, please. So the hot button uh, evaluates a number of different things. And uh, here in this, this chart, it kind of shows a, a rough breakdown. And apologies that the, uh, the text might be in, in smaller font than, than desirable. But uh, on the whole, we can see that some of the big ticket items there uh, with uh, nine, nine buttons that are allocated specifically for next generation uh, uh, alternative fiber sources. And this is both uh, research and development as well as uh, moving towards commercial production. And this uh, really is where we are seeing a lot of movement and we're quite excited that uh, the uh, producers are really responding uh, to that. Um, and we are also uh, providing a significant amount of points that, that uh, encourage uh, conservation actions. And so this uh, takes place in a number of different ways. Uh, and it can look different depending on uh, uh, if the uh, producer is uh, uh, vertically integrated, if they uh, have a physical presence in a, a specific landscape. Uh, and there's a lot of really interesting uh, actions that can take place uh, to earn that. A lot, significant amount of the points are linked directly to the audit. Uh, and so that includes uh, the level of risk and the uh, actions taken to address uh, some of that risk, and as well as uh, uh, and things that are related to uh, improving uh, the sources, uh, tracking and tracing. Uh, and it actually gets into quite a bit of detail. Uh, next slide, please. So, uh, what, one thing that I, I, was, uh, I wanted to mention is that this entire uh, process is really based uh, upon a premise of incremental improvement and a collaborative approach. So uh, before we issue the final scores in the fall, we actually start around mid-year uh, by issuing a, a preliminary profile uh, to each of the producers. We let them know where we see uh, they, where they are currently standing based on an early assessment. And we identify ways in which they can reach higher uh, and, and earn uh, more uh, points uh, by undertaking specific actions. And again, these are often connected to uh, uh, audit results, recommendations that have been made. And then we work collaboratively through those uh, 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 several months to look at ways to, to move in that direction. So that by the time we get to the uh, final result in the fall, this really represents uh, the, the, the best that they could do in, in that year in, in terms of reaching higher. So I'm very excited to report that this year we've seen uh, uh, three new additional producers join the ranks of a, uh, earning a green shirt. So that's uh, uh, having enough buttons to uh, uh, um, stand within uh, that those top tiers. This is up from last year's uh, uh, 10 uh, producers. And, uh, and overall, we are achieving that sort of critical mass of about 50% of the world's uh, global production that is in that uh, green ranks. Uh, nobody lost their shirt uh, this year. So we didn't see any uh, green shirts that, that went down. Uh, we did see that the top two uh, producers, um, and uh, did, yeah, Birla and Lenzing, uh, they both maintained their, their top rank of dark green shirts, which was great to see. But just as important, we saw a lot of movement in, in other uh, parts of the spectrum of color. Uh, so four of the uh, red shirts uh, of uh, managed to um, move out of the red. So they, they reached higher, earning uh, 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 from yellow to yellow-green. Uh, and this signals to us that the system is working. 
uh, we don't want any producer to stay uh, in the red. We, we really actively want to encourage that movement. Uh, so it was quite exciting to see that the process of getting an audit, acting on those uh, 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 recommendations, earn them the points that are moving them higher. And several of these, I would say, are poised to, to achieve a green shirt uh, uh, in the near term. Next slide, please. So we also have uh, a, a number of uh, producers that are still red shirt uh, or have red within their shirts uh, and uh, do not meet the minimum requirements uh, uh, for compliance. And uh, so this indicates that there are um, either known high risk in the pulp supply as confirmed by audits uh, and or uh, controversial sources remain in their supply, or we just uh, have a producer that uh, may be unresponsive. Um, next slide, please. So we have some colorful shirts here, uh, and I thought I'd just take a moment to explain a bit. Uh, so for the first time this year, we had a, uh, a situation where a producer earned enough uh, buttons uh, to uh, earn a, a green and yellow shirt. However, uh, that known risk remains within the supply chain. So we developed this, this shirt, it's a green, yellow, and red, and this is to recognize that uh, incremental improvement that has happened uh, over, over time and, uh, and, and the progress that has been made while still uh, uh, signaling that we uh, know that there's known risk associated uh, 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 with, with that producer uh, to ensure that that is still uh, communicated. Um, we also have a rainbow shirt and the rainbow shirt was created uh, so to recognize early uh, engagement uh, from a producer that is quite keen on moving towards an audit. Um, and uh, we want to recognize that, uh, that engagement. We love keeners, uh, but we also don't allow them to rest on their rainbow shirt for long. So we are giving them a year to move through that audit and to uh, 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 reach for um, the, the higher ranks uh, uh, and, and have that space to do it while sporting a very colorful uh, rainbow shirt. And finally, the white shirts. Uh, these are uh, producers that uh, we have yet to engage with, and, but that we hope to engage with and then to, uh, uh, if, if all goes well, to move them into the ranks of uh, more, more colored sh shirts in the coming year. Um, and I can say overall, you know, we've seen a lot of movement. We see white shirts become rainbows. We've seen rainbows become uh, 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 yellow and yellow become green. So it's quite satisfying for us to see that movement. Uh, next, please. Oh, and I would also say, if you want to learn more about that, I wrote a specific blog just on these colorful shirts. It gives a little bit uh, uh, more uh, clarity about exactly what the intention is there and what the status uh, number of producers in each of these ranks are. So looking at uh, next generation solutions, as mentioned, this is a really key part of uh, hot button and canopy style is uh, um, uh, really uh, providing incentives to move towards next generation solutions. And again, it's really satisfying to see that this is working, that there really are a lot of producers, uh, especially in China in the past year um, that we've seen uh, move on this. Uh, one of the things that we reward in the course of the hot button report is to provide information regarding uh, activities on next generation. So the many producers will fill out a survey that lets us know uh, what's, what's happening with research and development and, and trialing. And so through that process, we got to know that there are, are 12 producers right now that are actively testing, trialing, prototyping uh, next gen. This includes four of the top 10 producers uh, that have commercially available MMCF. Uh, and we are seeing that uh, a major commitments made by those top two dark green shirts. Uh, this was uh, 
uh, very exciting this year uh, to see that we had um, 100,000 tons committed by each of uh, uh, Birla and Lensing. Um, and this uh, from Birla, this, this 100,000 commitment uh, would be upwards of 30% next gen content by 2024. And Lensing committed to using 100,000 tons of recycled textile waste in their products by 2028, uh, which will then be mixed to produce larger volumes even still. So most producers are considering commercial production volumes ranging from 40,000 tons and as low as 1,800 tons a year. Uh, but I would say we're well poised to uh, scale up from there. And uh, we really are, are hoping to reach higher, but that needs to be backed by commitments uh, from brands to, to purchase this uh, and, and really help us achieve that. Um, that larger vision of, of converting the sector over to, to next generation. So the take home message, uh, sorry, next slide, please. Oh yeah, <laughs> seven producers uh, have, are actually supporting our vision, vision for Viscos, which is our long-term long -term vision of 50% next generation pr product uh, by 2030. Next slide, please. So overall, uh, the, the take home message I would say is that, uh, you know, at five years in hot button report is really hitting its stride. Those uh, subsurface uh, rather invisible components of canopy style are working and are supporting uh, actions that lead to the more visible uh, uh, performance and grading that happens within hot button uh, report and uh, with uh, 13 uh, uh, MMCF producers having a green shirt uh, at 50% uh, of global capacity. Uh, there really is the volume there uh, for retailers and brands to make those commitments uh, to going green shirt, um, as well as the diversity of different types of MMC MMCF products represented within those green shirts. Um, and that you know, we really see the, the conditions that uh, are required to uh, uh, keep building on that momentum and, uh, and to keep pulling through that, that volume uh, to achieve our, our vision ultimately. Uh, next slide, please. Now here's a, a look at uh, some of the commercially available products uh, that uh, of, of next generation, um, as well as uh, some, some that are well established, some that are relatively new, uh, all of which uh, we are, are celebrating in a, uh, a week long um, a promotion we call Circular Chic, which uh, uh, perhaps you've seen on our website. I highly recommend checking out our video. Uh, uh, it really captures the excitement that's, that's being generated by these uh, next generation fibers. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, next slide. There we go. Uh, so uh, we're here to help. We're we're very much interested in speaking to uh, anyone that that wants to you know find out more, find out how you can. Uh, make uh, commitments uh, to you know, buying green shirts and, and to uh, uh, making next gen, uh, um, uh, next generation volumes uh, and, and commitments. We're very much uh, here to put you in touch with people that uh, will help make that happen, um, as well as uh, uh, you know things like tracking and tracing and all that goes in behind the scenes, we're always quite keen to, uh, to engage with you. So please uh, reach out anytime. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, and I guess that's it. And perhaps we can move to questions then. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you, Peter. We have, um, I think we've learned a lot uh, from really basic initial understanding of, of the methodology and report, but also the new findings and successes. 
also next uh, gen. We have um, quite a few questions uh, from methodology all the way to also engagement with uh, the brand side, but also with the supply side, just from starting off maybe with a principle understanding questions. There's two. One, there is the, the kind of um, wagon wheel with the various colors. Um, could you just briefly say what what uh, what this um, chart what what the what it represents and also what the abbreviation um, AE and LR is in the button report? Okay, that's a very good question, and um, I'm apologies for uh, the acronym foul. I really um, I always need to be uh, reminded to spell. Uh, these acronyms out. A and E, uh, uh, forests for us are ancient and endangered forests. And uh, this is based on uh, a, a map that uh, uh, a mapping tool developed by Canopy that uh, establishes where in the in the world we have uh, ancient and endangered forests left. Uh, and again, if you visit our website, you can learn more about that forest mapping tool. Um, in terms of the um, um, Peter, just before you pivot, I think I think the question because they asked about LR and AE is talking about the summary acronyms for audit findings in the uh, hot button. Oh, oh, I see. Okay, yeah. my apologies. Sorry, I, I caught the A and E part. Yeah. Uh, so the uh, I'll just gonna I'm gonna pull up. Uh, perhaps uh, I can start pull and pull up the slide. Yeah. And I was just going to go over the um, the uh, the pie chart, but um, okay. So in the in the first of all, just to address your question about uh, where the uh, criterion buttons uh, come from, uh, there are six basic categories that range from uh, the uh, completion of an audit uh, and the uh, risk designation. There are uh, points associated with contributing to conservation legacies and conservation actions. There's the uh, pursuing next gen alternative fiber sources. Uh, there are uh, points available for adopting strong forest sourcing policies. Uh, there are points associated with demonstrating traceability and transparency through the supply chain. And finally, they're showing leadership in shifting their supply chain towards sustainable sources. Now, in addition to these positive uh, buttons, we also have uh, a certain number of buttons that uh, can be demerits. Though. So where there are uh, known risk identified uh, within the supply chain, uh, up to five buttons can be subtracted uh, based on that. Now, in addition to the subtraction of those buttons for the the uh, risk we also have a uh, specific designation uh around uh where the the risk uh, uh the the yeah the risk designation for each uh producer so the lr signifies low risk ae sig signals actively engaging suppliers but no known high risk uh, AR uh, indicates audit required. Uh, IP indicates an audit that's in process but not complete. KR uh, equals known risk confirmed in audit. And RP is risk to be assessed prior to audit. So this is perhaps a little bit uh, uh, granular. Uh, it's it's uh, some fine details here. But this is really important detail for us, uh, and it gives a bit of nuance to exactly where that producer is in the process, as well as the risk uh, level. And uh, we feel this is important uh, for brands that are really concerned about uh, knowing exactly uh, the risk levels that they're uh, undertaking in purchasing from that producer. Thank you. Thank you. And maybe um, you could also share a link to the methodology, because I think um, it is all um, available if people want to really go into the into the granularities. We have an, uh, two questions that I would like to combine on the criteria. Uh, one would be about environmental impact 
do you also look at LCA methodologies and how do you look at biodiversity or is that something we would need um, a whole hour really to, to talk about? I can start a little bit. Um, so, um, uh, uh, as and, and maybe uh, Peter and I can share both the link to the methodology of the hot button report, which is a publicly available as well. Uh, the audit framework is publicly available so you can take a look at all of the um, there's over 100 indicators and details within that. Um, so in terms of linking to bi biodiversity and LCA uh, data. Um, uh, basically uh, forest mapper, which is the grounding tool that we audit against uh, includes uh, many, many data layers uh, that we look at and they layer on top of each other um, and included within that uh, is some biodiversity data as well as well as specific species data. So we really do stand on the shoulders of giants uh, in terms of uh, some of those data layers. Uh, coming from the scientific community over the years, uh, other NGOs over the years, um, and they form the basis for how we define uh, the world's ancient and endangered forests. Um, LCA uh, data, um, we can share a link to a very, very um, interesting LCA uh, that we were on the uh, advisory committee for. It was uh, commissioned by Stella McCartney, undertaken by SCS Global, and it looks at 10 uh, different um, uh, man-made cellulosic uh, fiber um, uh, production chains and actually looks uh, across impact categories. So we're absolutely guided by that. So Canopy has a focus on forests, uh, but we're very uh, interested in not trading in one environmental issue for another and that LCA um, grounds us uh, in doing that as well. So we can share uh, those three links. Um, uh, maybe we can send that out with a follow up if we don't get to posting it in the Q&A as we go through more questions. <laughs> Definitely, thank you. Yeah. Um, when it comes to uh, the boundaries, we have two questions on ZDHC and, and the role of, of their guidelines. One is um, where does it kind of start? Where does it stop? Does it stop at fiber or do you look also at the further processing? So yarn and fabric. And the other would be um, without really going into the details of ZDHC, because I mean, this is maybe good input to also run an own webinar on the ZDHC guidelines, but how do you really, um, how do you track it or how, how is it verified or how do you, how does the bottle, the chemical button really um, end up um, showing the result? Peter, would you like me to? Take yes. this one. Yeah. Okay. So um, uh, last year was the first year uh, that the hot button included um, and started reporting on um, chemical processing, and uh, we defer entirely to our partners at uh, ZDHC. So um, it's early days is probably a good way to describe uh, those chemical bottles and that and that ranking. So this year, for example, um, there, ZDHC has developed three guidelines, um, wastewater, uh, responsible um, uh, fiber input, as well as air emissions. This year, the wastewater guidelines are the ones that are active and available for producers uh, to implement. And um, uh, those uh, producers received um, drops that added up to their flask color based on uh, two things. So one, were they part of a credible initiative uh, that could include ZDHC? Uh, it could also include uh, signing um, and, and uh, connecting with the changing markets roadmap. Um, uh, so that was one um, potential allocation of points. Uh, the second was, uh, had they applied the wastewater guidelines at all of their facilities and uploaded those results onto something called the detox platform. Um, so looking forward, of course, what we want that chemical flask to represent is the implementation of ZDHC's guidelines and the achieving of the different levels that ZDHC has um, from aspirational, foundational, and progressive being the three layers that ZDHC has. Uh, but we, we look to ZDHC to guide us on uh, how 
uh, of how um, the uptake of their program is going and we encourage producers to engage directly with their program and that will be reflected in the hot button moving forward. Uh, in terms of the other layers uh, in the supply chain, uh, there were questions about things like dyeing. Uh, ZDHC has, um, I know, uh, other programs uh, for those impacts. Those are not reflected in the hot button report. The hot button report is looking very specifically at that fiber production. Um, uh, so uh, you want to trace back to your fiber producers and they aren't responsible for dying and those kinds of things. So, um, so we want to just report on their uh, specific progress. Yeah. And I think that was a very valid question because ZDHC also yes. focuses on the wet processing stages, but with uh, the MMCF production, it's really the, the, um, the fiber production guidelines that were released. How about uh, one, two questions about social. Um, can you give a, a short summary of how social aspects are being looked at? Yeah, so uh, Canopy's work is focused on the social aspects of um, as it relates to frontline communities, so free prior and informed consent of uh, communities before logging uh, takes place or plantations are developed is really um, uh, uh, the, the elements that are uh, most robustly addressed within uh, our tools. Um, there are uh, uh, many more issues that are not covered within the hot button and, and we're very clear about that as well. So things like energy use at the mills, uh, not covered uh, by the hot button. Also things uh, like um, labor, uh, those kinds of issues are not covered adequately by the hot button. And uh, as we've seen um, uh, in our worlds, I think in all of our worlds these days, um, uh, you know, sometimes auditing is not necessarily the best way uh, to address some of the complexities of, of, of social issues. And we're mindful of that. So we're mindful um, uh, to connect our partners with other uh, credible NGOs uh, doing really good work on uh, some of those other issues as well. Um, correct, correct. Yeah, we can not uh, not one organization can can do it all. That um, I can relate to that also from a textile exchange perspective. We have a specific question on one of the um, audited companies uh, with uh, a question on Sateri as a very different color shirt, um, but. Uh, still seeing some red. How is Canopy supporting such suppliers to mitigate risks? Uh, I can take that one. Um, so, uh, in Sudbury, uh, there was this uh, recognition that uh, their performance in terms of the number of buttons uh, had improved. Uh, and we, uh, uh, this included uh, early stage efforts to support and advance conservation initiatives. Uh, in Indonesia, uh, the critically important Loser ecosystem, uh, there, want, there was a, an interest in ensuring that that, um, that performance was recognized uh, while uh, still being able to uh, indicate that there is uh, a known risk uh, associated with that uh, supply chain. So that, that uh, new shirt color was our creative way of, of trying to um, uh, recognize uh, both of those things simultaneously. Uh, and we are uh, uh, quite um, uh, looking forward to, you know, being able to uh, uh, reach higher in the coming year uh, and to look at ways in which uh, uh, risk can be uh, reduced uh, uh, through the course of the year. Um, Amanda, do you have any, Anything else to add to that? Yeah, just quickly. Um, uh, our model of change is all about collaborative engagement and working on solution paths. And um, um, Peter, uh, as well as four others on the Canopy team are very, very focused on working directly with producers and mapping out how to address risk, 
uh, how to avoid risk if possible, but also what are the solutions. Um, and uh, um, Satri and, and anybody else actually within that currently has a red shirt, our goal is to get them to green shirt and to work towards that. Um, so uh, it's really important if we think about our mission being for the world's forests, it's not to get to 50% uh, green shirts, it's actually to get to 100% green shirts. Um, so, uh, so Canopy invests a lot of time and probably most of our time uh, working at that uh, producer level and understanding what uh, constraints they might face uh, and also what opportunities we can build together. Yeah. And if people want to find out more on the, on the let's say, um, risks that still are mm -hmm. identified, do all sub these suppliers have their audit reports published? This is right. This is right. So the audit reports, um, you can link through to all of them from Canopy's website if you search under tools and audits. But also each producer is requested to publish, publicly share their entire audit um, as well the auditors themselves post the audit. So there's two places uh, where you can access those audits and, and you can feed through to all of those uh, from Canopy's website. Great, maybe we round up. We have set it for um, 45 to 50 minutes. So maybe um, I'm wrapping it up and we will definitely review all the remaining questions. Um, let us maybe wrap up with the question on the engagement with brands and retailers. We have one specific question on the forms of corporations with brands yeah so what that looks like and um and um uh canopy is very focused on any brand or retail so from the smallest designer to the largest uh, uh retailer we're we're very interested and we find that as we continue to grow that brand and retailer interest it of course uh, continues to send the signal that um, you know, getting a green shirt in the hot button report um, uh, provides greater uh, access to the marketplace. So it's 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 very important that anybody who wants to join the Canopy Style Initiative can. Uh, and what that looks like is we support you in developing a public facing policy or commitment um, about these fabric types uh, and about commitments to uh, eliminate ancient endangered forests and we make sure that that's aligned so not only will your policy be aligned with other brands and retailers but also with the producer policies uh, which are saying and echoing many of the same things so that we can create um, systemic change together Very good. Thank you very much. And um, so to, to wrap it up, and um, maybe this is also a time to ask for everyone to stay engaged. We have a few questions also on chemi chemical management and fiber production and how um, next gen feedstock is kind of processed. We had a webinar with um, sustainable textile solutions earlier this year, particularly on um, chemistry and uh, chemical management in fiber production. And this recording is also available on our on our hub on the textile exchange MMCF hub. So um, this is how to really stay engaged and where to find uh, resources and details um, is the Manmade Cellulosic Fibers Hub community. And if you're not part of that one yet, you can either contact me, Prana, or MMCF Roundtable at textileexchange.org. So let me now thank you all for. Um, being with us today, asking all these great questions. And thank you, Amanda and Peter, for um, all these uh, wonderful insights. Looking forward to working with you all next year. And um, yeah, have a great, great rest of the of the day and also rest of the of this very special and challenging year also. Thank you so much. And a huge thank you to Textile Exchange for hosting us. Uh, really appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you to our speakers and thank you for participating in today's webinar. As a friendly reminder, an email will be sent to all registered participants with a link to today's presentation. That concludes our webinar. Thank you. Goodbye. <laughs>